Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, Judge Barrett. Uh, to you and your family, uh, welcome. I guess I'm on the downside if you're halfway through. <laughs> um, if I might just, uh, at my opening, Mr. Chairman, I'll um, submit two letters for the record, if I might. One from the SEIU on behalf of the two million members of the Service Employees International uh, Union and one on behalf of a national uh, constellation of disability rights groups without both objection. expressing uh, concerns. Um, so, Judge Barrett, if I might, um, the calendar behind me makes clear something about the context that we're in. Because I think folks watching this at home, uh, despite the wonderful efforts uh, that a number of my colleagues have made to make this accessible, may have difficulty understanding exactly why we're here and why under these circumstances and why um, we keep bringing up the Affordable Care Act. So um, let me try and walk that through. Um, these aren't normal times, as you well know. Um, most of us are wearing masks. There are a number of members of this committee and the Senate who've been infected by COVID, as our president has, uh, and that's resulted in the Senate being closed this week and um, are not being able to proceed. We're in the middle of a pandemic, and we are just three weeks from an election, a presidential election in which uh, folks are voting in more than 40 states. Millions of votes have already been cast. And just a week after that election, the Supreme Court's going to hear a case um, that could take away health care protections from more than half of all Americans. So this is not an abstract academic argument. It's one that will have real life consequences. Destroying the essential protections of the Affordable Care Act, which was enacted just more than a decade ago, uh, would have a real impact on a majority of all Americans. It prevents insurance companies from discriminating against the more than 100 million Americans with pre-existing conditions like diabetes or heart disease. It dramatically expanded Medicaid, and it provides coverage for kids on their parents' insurance up to the age of 26, I should say young adults. Um, and perhaps most importantly, since a lot of what we've been talking about is the legacy of Justice Ginsburg and her lifelong commitment to gender equity, um, it also prevents insurance companies, the Affordable Care Act does, from discriminating against women just for being women. It may be hard to imagine now, but more than a decade ago before the ACA, pregnancy was treated as a pre-existing condition, and women were routinely charged more than men uh, just because insurance companies could. So President Trump, he said over and over again that he is determined to repeal the Affordable Care Act, that he is determined to overthrow it. And there's two things all of us are waiting for. One is his detailed health plan. The other is his taxes. And I don't expect either one of them in the next three weeks. The president tried to do it here in Congress. In fact, I think by one count, uh, my colleagues have voted 70 times to overturn the ACA. Um, and many uh, in this chamber, many members of this committee, um, members like Senators Cornyn and, and Lee and others, have filed amicus briefs before the Supreme Court asking for the law to be struck down. So now on the eve of the election, I believe President Trump is making a last gasp attempt to get the Supreme Court to do it for him. He can't do it through the democratic process. He can't do it administratively. He's going to try and do it with one more challenge. And as you well know, Judge, it was upheld eight years ago in a five to four decision where Chief Justice Roberts wrote a critical, decisive piece of the majority opinion. But Justice Scalia, for whom you're clerked, your mentor, whose broad philosophy you embrace, dissented. He thought it was unconstitutional and voted to strike down the entirety of the law. Um, you wrote an article in uh, Constitutional Commentary in 2017 um, in which you were quite critical of Chief Justice Roberts' decision. And so I want to ask you about that article um, not as a matter of debating abstract uh, academic principles, but because I believe the outcome in this case a week after the election may hang in the balance. You wrote in that article, and I quote, in NFIB versus Sibelius, the case that upheld the ACA against a constitutional challenge, Chief Justice Roberts pushed the Affordable Care Act beyond its plausible meaning to save the statute. I think those are fighting words as an originalist and a textualist. You were referring to Chief Justice Roberts' ruling that the individual mandate in the ACA is constitutional under Congress's taxing powers, a ruling essential to upholding the law and protecting the health care of a majority of Americans. So just if you could, do you think the Chief Justice's ruling upholding the ACA was implausible and unsound? Well, Senator Coons, um, 
what I said in that article, which was a book review of someone else's book, was that the statutory interpretation, as I said earlier, as Chief Justice Roberts' own opinion said, was the less natural reading of the mandate, construing it as a tax rather than a penalty, um, that the statutory interpretation seemed, as you said, stretched beyond its plausible meaning. But NFIB versus Sebelius turned on the constitutional question. That was the statutory interpretation was the threshold question. Right. And the constitutional question was not something that I ever opined on. And the case next week, um, or the case that's coming down the pike in a few weeks, California versus Texas, I'd, I wouldn't say they're fighting words from the article that you read, be, read from me, um, because the California versus Texas case Envires, involves a very different issue, this issue of severability. And for those to be fighting words, I think you would have to assume that my you know, critique of the reasoning reflects a hostility to the act that would cause me to approach a case involving the ACA with hostility and looking for a way to take it down um, to deprive people of their coverage under the ACA because I didn't like it. But I can promise you that that is not my view, it's not my approach to the law. I have no hostility to the ACA or any other law, and that I will faithfully apply the law. And nothing that I've said um, with respect to the ACA in print, in my law review articles, actually bears on the severability question. So it's not indicative of how I might approach that question. Let me go back to what I perhaps too jokingly referred to as fighting words. You're both textualists. You're both from the same general school of constitutional methodology, correct? You mean Justice Scalia and me? And Chief Justice Roberts. I'm not actually sure that Chief Justice Roberts has ever identified himself as a textualist. So to that but point, um, in this article three years ago, you, you chastised Chief Justice Roberts for not being a textualist. You said he has not proven himself to be a textualist and has been willing to depart from ostensibly clear text. And so you said in this article, and I'm quoting you, it is illegitimate for the court to distort either the Constitution or a statute to achieve what it deems a preferable result. So this was the sort of outcomes-oriented um, judicial crafting that has often been sharply criticized by your mentor, Justice Scalia, when criticizing the sort of living constitutionalists. And as I read this, um, you are saying to Chief Justice Roberts, you're no textualist. You have overreached. You have delivered an implausible conclusion. Uh, and frankly, I disagree with your upholding the constitutionality of this statute. That seems to me, again, as a textualist here, a plain reading of your own writing. Well, Senator Coons, I want to make very, very clear, I think maybe this is, came up with Senator Klobuchar, that I was not attacking or you know, chastising Chief Justice Roberts at all, for whom I have the greatest respect. Um, I think this passage that you're talking about in this book review and constitutional commentary was maybe a couple paragraphs, maybe even one paragraph at the end, because it was a comment on Randy Barnett's book, and, and a lot of his book dealt with the NFIB versus Sebelius as, as an example. So I was responding to that. And the sentence that you read me about it's illegitimate for a court to twist lang language in pursuit of a policy goal, that is what I think. That's what I was telling Senator Sass. I mean, I, I don't think it is the job of courts to pursue policy goals that the text that you enact doesn't support. So to be clear, you're, you're specifically accusing the Chief Justice, or you're chastising might be the better word, the Chief Justice of distorting the statute um, and of upholding it when it should have been struck down. No, I'm not. I was not. I said I was not chastising. All I was doing was expressing some, well, I mean, and as I've said several times, it's how the Chief Justice himself characterized it. It's not the most natural reason, reading of that language, and all I was well, doing if, was... if I might, Your Honor, I, I don't think the Chief Justice would agree with that characterization. He didn't describe his own opinion as not plausible. He said less natural, and, less and natural. I thought it was implausible. But not unsound. So, Senator Coons, I certainly would not and did not criticize or chastise the Chief Justice or impugn his integrity. It is true that Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Scalia took different approaches to the text in the Affordable Care Act case, which is something that's widely acknowledged. I'm simply trying to make clear that I think your writing here in 2017 in constitutional commentary, um, yes, the majority of it is a book review. 
um, about a book that centrally talks about NFIB versus Sibelius and methodological questions. But near the end, you are, I think, unmistakably clear in saying, I disagree with the Chief Justice's ruling upholding the Affordable Care Act, and I deem it unplausible and unsound. Senator, as an academic, I did express a critique. And I, you know, you, you've quoted the language, you've pulled out those few sentences at the end. Um, I guess I'm a little uncertain what it indicates, um, because as I've said, I have no hostility to the ACA, and if a case came up before me presenting a different question of the ACA, I would approach it with no bias or hostility. I also have said um, at earlier points in this hearing that the exercise of being a commentator, an academic, is much different than the enterprise of judging. And I didn't have to sit in Chief Justice Roberts' seat or Justice Scalia's seat when NFIB versus Sebelius was decided. So but you will, if we follow the timeline laid out by my colleagues, you will sit in former Justice Ginsburg's seat. And you will sit as a member of the court deciding a case that is very similar to the previous one in which the central issue before the court, believe it or not, somehow will be the constitutionality of the mandate that's in some ways um, been the linchpin of its being upheld previously in NFIB versus Sebelius. That was the, the sort of key point was that at the end of the day, there were five justices who for different reasons concluded that they could uphold it in the case of the Chief Justice as a legitimate exercise of the taxing power. You wrote, and this is the next sentence, that Chief Justice Roberts, if he had treated the payment owed under the mandate as the statute did, as a penalty, he would have had to invalidate it. So I think you're unmistakably criticizing this decision to uphold the Affordable Care Act in a case that will be before you as a newly seated member of the Supreme Court if the majority continues with this race towards your confirmation. It is the nerve center of the case. It's it, it, the entire future of the Affordable Care Act, I think, hinges on this question of whether or not um, you share a view with the four who were in the minority at the time um, that this is something that cannot be upheld under any plausible reading of the statute. Let me move on, if I might, um, Judge Barrett. You're, you're not the only person who's criticized um, Chief Justice Roberts for his decision to uphold the ACA. Um, President Trump criticized him for it sharply and repeatedly. Um, soon after the NFIB decision first came out in 2012, he tweeted um, that Justice Roberts turned on his principles with irrational reasoning in order to get loving press. And then later, congratulations to John Roberts for making Americans hate the Supreme Court because of his BS. A few years later, while running for president, then candidate Trump said on Twitter, and I believe my colleague put this up earlier, if I win the presidency, my judicial appointments will do the right thing, unlike Bush's appointee, John Roberts, on Obamacare. And as recently as just two months ago, Vice President Pence described Chief Justice Roberts as, and I'm quoting, a disappointment to conservatives because of the Obamacare decision. In upholding the ACA, the Chief Justice was the one justice appointed by a Republican president who went against the political wishes of the party that appointed him. Why did you choose to single him out for criticism in that constitutional commentary article? Um, well, Senator Coons, I was writing about the majority opinion, and Chief Justice Roberts was the author of the opinion. So I was simply discussing what the five justice majority adopted as its reasoning. And I'd like to emphasize again that I was not attacking Chief Justice Roberts or impugning his character or anything of that sort. It was an academic critique. And I, I want to emphasize, you know, just given these, this line of questions that you're asking that, you know, I am standing before the committee today saying that I have the integrity to act consistently with my oath and apply the law as the law, um, to approach the ACA and every other statute without bias, and I have not made any commitments or deals or anything like that. I'm, I'm not here on a mission to destroy the Affordable Care Act. I'm just here to apply the law and adhere to the rule of law. 
And I, look, I think it is important that folks um, watching understand that I believe your views are sincere and, and earnestly held. And I am not trying to suggest that there was some uh, secret deal between you and President Trump. When you told me that when we spoke a week ago, I've had no conversations about these cases with the president or his legal team. I believe you. Um, I think you are a person um, who earnestly means that. And, and I do think it's important um, that you keep repeating that. But we cannot ignore the larger context that sits outside um, your, your nomination and this rushed process. Um, I'm sure you have no ill will towards the Chief Justice and meant no disrespect to him as an individual. We've talked repeatedly about the friendship between um, Justice Scalia and Justice Ginsburg. Um, you know, I was long inspired by the friendship between Senators Biden and Senator McCain, and they fought hammer and tongs, tooth and nail, disagreed with each other on foreign policy day in and day out, but then could still also spend time together with each other's families and respect each other afterwards. And to the point my colleague from Nebraska has made about civics versus politics, it is important for us to try and sustain these institutions that hold us together. And you and Senator Flake, I think, are another good example of that. Indeed. Um, as you well know, we came to Notre Dame Law School just over a year ago to talk about um, working together even across significant differences. Um, but the, the, the broader context that Senator Whitehouse um, went through in detail was as you are expressing opinions in an academic journal, there is literally an army of lobbyists and lawyers and people, um, donors um, and activists who are funneling new judges into our courts. And I have sat here for four years and watched a whole procession of judges um, where, without going on about this too much, you know, a dozen have been deemed unqualified to serve. This is not a comment on you. But the speed and the process and the disrespect for some of the critical traditions of this body in terms of the blue slip and who gets nominated and why um, has made it harder and harder to see the independence of the judicial branch. And in this piece that you wrote in 2017, you made, I think, your position with regards to the Chief Justice and his opinion clear. Let me, if I could, put up another poster that may make this a little um, sharper in a way that is the political branch is not the judicial branch. Um, the Supreme Court's going to hear arguments, as I've said, in this case, a week after the election. And most Americans are probably surprised to even hear about it. When I, when I talk to a constituent, Carrie, um, who has a pre-existing condition, um, she was surprised this was even in front of the court. She said, I thought that was settled. Um, Carrie owns a small business. She has a daughter she's raising. And before the ACA, she had to spend $800 a month for insurance that she described as junk. Um, left her afraid of even going to the doctor's office or needing drugs. And because of the ACA, she's been able to get better quality insurance that she can afford. Um, and she's got both type 2 diabetes and high blood pressure. But the ACA guarantees she can't be denied insurance or made to pay higher premiums either because of her gender or because of these pre-existing conditions. Um, she expressed to me astonishment Many of us are engaged and interested in this because we care about the Constitution, we care about constitutional law, and the ways in which it impacts a majority of all Americans, frankly, all Americans. Help me explain to her, how is it that the Affordable Care Act settled eight years ago is back in front of the Supreme Court? Well, Senator, I spent some time with Senator Sass talking about how a case winds its way up, and it's because litigants chose to challenge the law again. And, you know, it went through the district court and the Fifth Circuit, and, and now the Supreme Court has granted certiorari on it and is answering the question. But as to the broader question, which I think is a political one, which is why are people fighting the Affordable Care Act, you have to ask the litigants. Um, I don't, you know, I don't know why they're fighting the Affordable Care Act. Well, uh, two things on that. Um, yes, there are no advisory opinions, as you said in your exchange with Senator Sass, and you have to have standing. The courts are reactive. But as Senator Whitehouse laid out, there's a whole network of groups that fund and develop and present test cases over and over and over. And this is an issue that will be before the court just a week after the election that is really not distinguishable from NFIB versus Sibelius. I mean, they are centrally about the constitutionality of the mandate, whether it's a legitimate exercise 
of the taxing power, you don't get to the question of severability if you haven't already determined the question of constitutionality. But I think that the question of severability, even if the now zeroed out mandate provision is a penalty, it doesn't affect the act at all if that position, if that provision can be severed out, then the whole rest of the act would stand. And so I actually think that severability is sort of the, you know, I think severability is one of the most important issues in the case. I don't think the question of characterizing it as a tax versus a penalty, you know, NFIB versus Sibelius also was interpreting a different provision. It was one that wasn't zeroed out that actually had uh, money attached to it. But if I could, um, this is um, the filing of the Department of Justice in the Supreme Court. As you well know, um, the Justice Department is supposed to defend the constitutionality of federal laws if any reasonable defense can be made. And the Trump Justice Department has sided with those advocates who are trying once again to strike the law down now in the courts when they couldn't accomplish that uh, here. In fact, I'd, I'd argue that they're denying the will of the voters that clearly in 2018 in deciding uh, control of the House on health care um, want this to stay. And the administration's arguing that this now toothless mandate, which imposes no, pa no payment on anyone, is unconstitutional, and they're arguing the entire act must be struck down as a result. I frankly think the DOJ is embarrassed by this brief. They rarely even talk about it, but it's in black and white in the quotes over my shoulder that the mandate is unconstitutional and must go, and so the parts of the law that prevent insurance companies from discriminating against people with pre-existing conditions that prevent discrimination against women, all of it must fall as a result. Um, it seems to me that uh, Americans who are watching deserve to understand that this is somehow back up in front of the court, the posture the administration is taking, the ways in which it really does follow some of the contours of NFIB versus Sibelius, uh, and the ways in which, uh, bluntly, um, well, I know you won't talk about this pending case, what you said in that 2017 article, what you wrote, is highly relevant. Um, just as a preliminary point, the vote to uphold the ACA in NFIB versus Sibelius was five to four, correct? Yes. And Justice Ginsburg was in the majority and Justice Scalia in the minority? Yes. So if you were to replace Justice Ginsburg with someone who followed precisely Justice Scalia's analysis on the linchpin question of constitutionality, one could expect it would be overturned. Um, no, Senator Coons, because if there were a direct challenge to NFIB versus Sibelius, there would be precedent on point. And the law of stare decisis is a whole body of doctrine that binds judges itself. So um, no, I don't think one could assume that in a separate point in time that even Justice Scalia would necessarily decide the case the same way once there was precedent on the books. Um, I agree, and I look forward to discussing that in some more detail tomorrow. I have just, I think, six minutes. Your views of precedent, Justice Scalia's views of precedent, and the ways in which they may diverge, um, I think are important and important for us to spend some time on. Um, let me just recap this point. Um, for President Trump, for Republican politicians, um, the argument about tax and about whether or not the mandate is a tax is the gateway to knocking down the entire Affordable Care Act. And that's also the line of attack being taken by the Department of Justice. You've already said it's not plausible to interpret the mandate as a tax. If you didn't think it was a tax when it was raising billions of dollars in revenue, you certainly, I think, are unlikely to believe it's a tax when it raises no revenue. And the thing that might distinguish it from NFIB versus Sibelius is reliance interests and precedent. And when I have more time tomorrow, um, we'll go through that. But I just wanted to connect some dots. That Trump has repeatedly vowed to get rid of the ACA, has campaigned on it, has criticized the Chief Justice, has said his nominees would do the right thing. His administration is, is in court right now, arguing in a case to be heard in just four weeks that it should be invalidated. and. A person you've criticized, Chief Roberts, a person whose opinion, whose decision you have criticized, Justice Roberts, um, means in many ways that you've signaled, I think. You were added to the Supreme Court shortlist after you wrote that article. And today, my Republican colleagues, who themselves have promised to repeal the ACA, are rushing through your nominations so you can be seated in time to hear this case. It, it, concerns me 
gravely that that's the circumstances we're in. Let me ask one last line of questioning, if I might, in the five minutes I have left. There's another subject on which President Trump has been, I think, unfortunately, very, very clear about what he hopes for from a Supreme Court nominee. Just days after Justice Ginsburg passed, the president was asked why there was such a rush to fill her seat before the election. And he responded, and I quote, we need nine justices. You need that. With the millions of ballots that they, and he meant the Democrats, are sending, it's a scam, it's a hoax. You're going to need nine justices. The next day, he told reporters, again, he doubled down, I think this, and he means the election from the context, will end up in the Supreme Court. It's very important. We must have nine justices. Our president has also been asked whether he'll commit to a peaceful transition if he loses the election. He's been asked directly and repeatedly. And instead of responding in the way we'd expect of any leader of the free world, with a clear and simple yes, he's tried to sow confusion and distrust in the potential results. So, Your Honor, I'm concerned that what President Trump wants here couldn't be clear, that he's trying to rush this nomination ahead so you might cast a decision, a vote, in his favor in the event of a disputed election, and he's doing his level best to cast doubt on the legitimacy of an election in which literally millions of votes have already been cast, most of them by mail. I was very encouraged, again, to hear from you specifically you have not had any conversation with him about this topic, and that's not what I'm suggesting. In fact, you repeated promptly 28 U.S.C. 455. You're quite familiar with the recusal statute and its considerations. But I think the gravamen, the core, the, the core issue in recusal is that any judge or justice should recuse themselves from a case in which their impartiality might reasonably be questioned. Given what President Trump said, Given the rushed context of this confirmation, will you commit to recusing yourself from any case arising from a dispute in the presidential election results three weeks from now? Senator Coons, thank you for giving me the opportunity to clarify this, because I want to be very clear for the record and to all members of this committee that no matter what anyone else may think or expect, I have not committed to anyone or so much as signaled. I've never even written. I've been in a couple of opinions in the Seventh Circuit that have been around the edges of election law. But I haven't even written anything that I would think anybody could reasonably say, oh, this is how she might resolve an election dispute. And I would consider it, let's see, I certainly hope that all members of the committee have more confidence in my integrity than to think that I would allow myself to be used as a pawn to decide this election for the American people. So that would be on the question of actual bias. And you asked about the appearance of bias. Correct. And you're right that the statute does require a justice or judge to recuse when there is an appearance of bias. And what I will commit to every member of this committee, to the rest of the Senate, and to the American people, is that I will consider all factors that are relevant to that question, um, relevant to that question that requires recusal when there's an appearance of bias. And there is case law under the statute and as I referenced earlier, in describing the recusal process at the Supreme Court, Justice Ginsburg said that it is always done with consultation of the other justices. And so I promise you that if I were confirmed and if an election dispute arises, you know, both of which are ifs, um, that I would very seriously undertake that process and I would consider every relevant factor. I can't commit to you right now for the reasons that we've talked about before, but I do assure you of my integrity, and I do assure you that I would take that question very seriously. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, just on the question of consultation, um, the Chief Justice, former Chief Justice Rehnquist, um, because this question came up in 2004, wrote a letter actually to members uh, of this committee that there's no formal procedure for court review of a decision by a justice in individual cases. It's just something Justice Ginsburg did say, that there was a practice of consultation. I, I do think at the end of the day, what matters is removing any potential um, conflict here. Um, ensuring that there is confidence um, in our election, in the Supreme Court, and in its role is critical. Um, I have reached out to a number of my colleagues to implore them to step back from the timing of this confirmation, to consider the possible confluence of three different factors here, an election, an ACA case, and um, a rush timing in the middle of a pandemic. And I would just 
urge them one more time to think seriously about stepping back from this timing of this confirmation. That's not meant to impugn you or suggest that in some way you've engaged in some inappropriate conversation. That's just the confluence of these events at this time in this place. This election will have enormous consequences. Um, I am troubled by what you've written about the Affordable Care Act. Um, I am more concerned that the President has tried over and over and over to get rid of the ACA and that the American people have consistently said no and that the consequences for a majority of Americans who rely on the ACA in the middle of a pandemic um, would be significant um, and that the President has refused to embrace the American people's wishes and deliver um, some compelling alternative plan and instead has taken the battle back to the Supreme Court where it will be heard in just a month. I think to reach out and to strike this critical statute down now would be the worst example of judicial activism, uh, which my colleagues say they don't want, and which I hope will not happen, but I am gravely concerned by what I see. Your Honor, I believe your views are sincere, um, but I also think you genuinely think the Affordable Care Act is unconstitutional. That's my reading. Um, and you are entitled to that view. But this body and the American people, we shouldn't kid ourselves. Uh, bluntly, if, if our president and the majority are able to swing the court out of balance um, by replacing Justice Ginsburg by someone whose views may be significantly to the right, the health of a majority of Americans may well be in peril. Thank you, Your Honor.